So, gentlemen, um, let me um, frame this evening's discussion in that we are um, we're going to focus on some of the larger sort of mega issues, perhaps more than the minute-to-minute -minute, uh, timely news of the day, although we might have time for that too. But I think it's a unique opportunity for all of us to hear two close friends discuss some of these issues that they've been talking about for 25 years. The ambassador and Yossi deeply understand and care about the U.S.-Israel relationship, the relationship between American Jews and Israel, about what it means to be a Jew in an existential moment. And we hope to hear your thoughts and various, from various perspectives, okay. Jewish, Israeli, historical, and spiritual. So we're going to start by uh, going back to the heady, if not miraculous, days just after the Six-Day War, 1967. Yossi's going to read an, uh, a brief excerpt from the book just to sort of set the scene. And if you want to give us a little um, taste of, of the time, we're talking about 1967, just after the Six-Day War. This is actually a, uh, a very apt moment to, to, to read because it takes off from where Michael's book left off. This is now the summer of 1967. The war, the victory has been won, and we are now in the euphoric aftermath. To be an Israeli in the summer of 1967 was to be a hero. Everyone had a share in the victory. The high school students who had distributed mail, the pensioners who'd enforced the blackout, even the ultra-Orthodox who had violated the Sabbath to fill sandbags. An instant documentary film on the war played to pack theaters when an ultra-Orthodox soldier appeared on screen, secular Israelis cheered. With the magnanimity of victors, Israelis forgave each other their ideological flaws. Mm. How did we do it, Israelis asked themselves, sharing the wonder expressed around the world. In six days, a country of less than three million had defeated three Arab armies, conquered mountains, ancient market labyrinths, desert expanse. Israel had more than tripled its size from 8,000 to 26,000 square miles. And not just territories, but Judea and Samaria. When Jews in exile had prayed to be restored to the land of Israel, they'd meant Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Hebron. Bookstores displayed instant photo albums of the victory, as if Israelis needed some explanation of how the nation had moved in barely one month from fears of a second Holocaust to military mastery of the Middle East. Kiosks sold necklaces with bullets and hung signs that read, All Honor to the IDF. Moshe Dayan half smiled from falafel stands. The new slang for stepping on the gas was Bensur Drive, Matagur's cry to his driver as the paratroopers crashed through the lion's gate. The war seemed to end Israelis' great unspoken question. Could a country under permanent siege by its neighbors and whose wildly diverse population hadn't functioned together as a nation for 2,000 years overcome the odds and survive? The answer of June 1967 seemed unequivocal. Israel was here to stay. In celebrating their military prowess, Israelis were celebrating existence. For Jews to have learned to fight so well, so soon after they had died in their helpless millions, was an affirmation of their life force. The world hadn't changed. Not only was Auschwitz possible, but so was an assault on its survivors. No matter, the Jews had changed. So as, it, as it's been noted, this, tonight it's just five days before the 40th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War, um, which took place just six years later. We can talk a little bit about what happened from that uh, euphoric time to a time when it seemed that uh, 
Israel was in, in danger of, of being destroyed. Sort of the impact on the Israeli psyche. <clears throat> The, um, the shift from 1967 to 1973 is really, the, in some ways, the, the, the map of Israel's psyche, of moving from, from the exaltation of redemption or an approximation of redemption, which of course was 1967, to the sense of the abyss of, of, of God forbid, another, another imminent holocaust. And so much of... of the Israeli psyche shifts back and forth between, between these experiences of, of, of exaltation, of redemption, and despair. And there is something, I, there, is, there is a profound imbalance, uh, which, which is, is a reflection of a people emerging from the Shoah three years later into, into the state of Israel. That shift from, from our our worst nightmare to our greatest dream, happening virtually simultaneously. And in some way, I think the shift from 1967 to 73 was a replay of that experience. And 1973, in, 1967 unleashed exaggerated ecstasy, and 1973 unleashed exaggerated despair. And this is something, Michael, I remember we spoke a lot about, something I learned from you which was that, that, the, that Yom Kippur, in fact, and I think you said this, was our greatest military victory. By far. More impressive than 1967, because in 67 we had the element of surprise, and Yom Kippur were attacked on two fronts. In less than two weeks, not only have we beaten the surprise attack back, but we crossed the canal, and it's the same men who who liberate the wall in 1967, the same characters that I write about, were the men who crossed the canal on the night of October 16, 1973, reversed the war, and essentially won the war for Israel. The paratroopers who crossed with Sharon, and I didn't know this when I started, when I started out on this book, and I went to interview the, uh, one, of the, one of the men, Arik Achmon, who it turns out led the crossing. And I said to him, uh, this goes back now 11 years, I said, tell me something about yourself. And he said, well, uh, after 67, I led the crossing of the canal. I said, wait a minute, you were, you, the paratroopers crossed the canal? He said, before we continue this interview, go back, do your homework, and then come back, and, and we'll do the interview again. So the extraordinary revelation that the very same people who gave us our most mythic victory in 67 gave us arguably our greatest military victory in 73. What's that? No, it, it, it's true, and we are, since 1973, we've been living with what I call Dol Sinai, mm -hmm. uh, the generation of Sinai, mm -hmm. which has been wandering um, for 40 years. Describe that. Right, that's, that's great. That's great. That's good great um, <laughs> wandering from, you know, I, I've told Yossi many times, it was the war in which Yossi Balin, a, a prominent leftist, uh, Israeli politician stopped putting on tefillin because right, he had been religious and it was a war in which Efe Tam, a right-wing um, former kibbutznik, started putting on tefillin. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. it is a war, that entire generation um, was so profoundly uh, traumatized and altered that it, that it deeply colored Israel's uh, politics. And what's extraordinary coming from America is, in America you're used to getting surprise attacks, you know. Um, Fort Sumter, Pearl Harbor, um, all begins with a surprise attack. America turns around and wins the war, and it's celebrated as America's greatest victory. Okay, we, it was an intelligence failure in October 1973. By the way, Six Day War was no less an intelligence failure. The Israeli intelligence predicted that in 1967 that war would not break out in the Arab world before 1970. Mm -hmm. And uh, complete intelligence failure. One cut our way, one cut the other way. Um, but as you said, it, resu it results in Israel's greatest military victory. If you go to uh, West Point, and I've been to West Point, you go to any military academy around the world, and they are studying not the 1967 war, they study the 1973 war. <laughs> because it was a war where an army had a certain doctrine, and within three days it completely altered its doctrine to meet a challenge on the battlefield, which armies almost can never do. Look how long it took America 
to deal with, the, with, the, with, the, with an insurgency in Iraq. It took years. We did it in three days. And, um, and yet, in Israel today, the Yom Kippur War is this period of deep, every year, not just on the 40th anniversary, every anniversary is soul searching, soul chest beating. 2,600 Israelis lost their lives. That would be the equivalent today in per capita terms of 230,000 Americans killed in three weeks. Think about that. So it wasn't just the setback on the battlefield, the fact that everybody knew so many people, and particularly from the world that Yossi's writing about, the world of the kibbutz. The kibbutzim were devastated by Yom Kippur because they were overrepresented in the combat units. Devastated. The kibbutz began to lose its vitality, really decline as a result of 73. So Yossi, um, <clears throat> you told me recently when I asked you um, who you intended this book for, you, you said, in a way I was writing the book for myself, for the person I would have become if I hadn't made Aliyah, someone obsessed by Israel vicariously and knowing the general story, but not understanding what it was really like from the inside. So it seems you were in, attempting to create a, a unified Israeli narrative that brings the left and the right into the same story post-1967. Uh, can you give us a, an example, perhaps, from the book to, to explain this uh, coming together? Well, the, first of all, just, just to, to say a word about, about that, that point, because for me, that's crucial. Are they really, I, my goal in, in, in writing this book was to restore the left and the right to the same story. And the device was to actually place them uh, in, in the same unit and to discover that some of the leaders of the settlement movement and the leaders of the peace movement all came out of the same proverbial tent. They shared the same military experience. And there are two men that for me really represent, represent what happened to Israel uh, as a result of the 73 war and this, this, this separation uh, and in which the same experience can be filtered through, through, through opposite sensibilities and reaching totally different political conclusions. So two, two men. One is Hanan Porat, a name some of you no doubt will be familiar with. Hanan Porat was the founder, essentially the founder, of uh, the first settlement, Kfar Etzion, in, in, uh, September, in September 67. Hanan Porat is badly wounded in the Yom Kippur War. His unit crosses the Suez Canal. A, a shell, a mortar shell, crashes into his, helm, into his shoulder and amazingly does not explode. And it bounces off and the explosion happens a bit in, in the distance and that's what saves his life. His chest is filled with shrapnel. He's lying in the hospital room recovering, and he realizes he has this a kind of a personal revelation where he feels that God has saved him for a great mission, and he needs to take the model of Kfar Etzion, this first settlement that he founded in 1967, and turn it into the settlement movement. And so the settlement movement is born in Hanan Porat's hospital room as he's recovering. Second story. Avital Geva, same unit. Avital is a kibbutznik, Hashomer Atzair, coming out of the movement that Michael grew up in, the, the, uh, the, very, the left wing, I would say, Marxist, the Marxist Zionist uh, youth movement. Uh, and as far as I know, Michael, you're not a Marxist anymore. Is that, is that fair to say? Post Marxist. Post, post Marxist. <laughs> and, um, and so Avital Geva, coming out of that deep, left-wing Zionist experience, wounded in 1967. Even before the paratroopers managed to cross into East Jerusalem, he's hit by a mortar and he misses the war. In 73, he's commanding a unit that is fighting in Suez City, the last, the very last battle of the Yom Kippur War. And his, his men are going house to house, house to house combat, they come to the main street of Suez City, cease fire, the war is over. Midday, cease fire is declared, both sides honor the cease fire, 
And the Egyptians are on one side of the street, and the Israelis are on the other side. And suddenly, Avital sees his men are moving toward the Egyptians, and the Egyptians are moving toward them. They meet in the middle of the street, and they shake hands. And some of the men embrace. Five minutes earlier, house-to-house -house combat. Five minutes later, peace in the Middle East. Avital's immediate instinct is to protect his men. He has to rush in, retrieve them, and that's what he does. He pulls them out, but he has glimpsed the possibility of peace. So that four years later, when Anwar Sadat comes to Jerusalem, Avital remembers that moment in Suez City and says, this is the moment when peace is possible. We have to believe that peace is possible, and he becomes one of the founders of Peace Now, the anti-settlement movement. Two men, two wounded paratroopers, Brigade 55, reaching totally opposite conclusions. And if I have any message in this book to a deeply divided American Jewry today, an American Jewry that's divided over Israel, it's that we need to, whatever our politics are, keep your politics, don't change them, but, what, but embrace both Avital Geva and Hanan Parat. So, can I ask my question? So, so you know, you, you, what we used to talk about all the time in this book, it's about Jewish utopianism. And you got pretty extreme characters. There's the people on the right, the people on the left. Everyone is, is messianic in its own way. How about the rest of us in the middle? The, uh, I remember you used to tell me uh, that someone reading this book who doesn't know Israel, or perhaps even who does, will think that it's a lunatic asylum. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and by, and by what is crazy You were really worried. You were really worried. You know, yeah. where, why aren't you writing about anybody normal? They're kibbutzniks and settlers, and they're all running around. They're either, they're either building settlements or trying to dismantle settlements. Most Israelis don't live in a settlement and aren't actively trying to dismantle settlements. So that's, that's right. The, the amazing resilience and I think the innate wisdom of Israeli society is that after 40 years of profound ideological schism between the utopians of the left and the utopians of the right, the victors are the normal center. That, that is now the majority of Israel, and perhaps it always was the majority, but now we have a strong political center, really representing, in some sense, the, the, the insights of left and right. Most Israelis today agree with the left, including the Prime Minister of the State of Israel, Oli Kudnik, that the occupation is bad for Israel. We need, we need to free ourselves from the occupation. At the same time, most Israelis would agree with the right that you can't make peace with a Palestinian national movement that does not accept your basic legitimacy, and it still does not accept our legitimacy. And so we are caught between these two truths, the truth of the left and the truth of the right, and that's where we're stuck today. But Michael, when you ask really where, 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 and, and I tried to, to the, if, if I can give away the last chapter of the book, it's not really that suspenseful. We all, we all kind it, of Israel survives. We are, it, Israel <laughs> survives. <laughs> Against all odds, Israel Barely, survives. barely, barely. But it makes it. And uh, the, last, the last chapter is called careening toward the center. Because in Israel, we never evolve in a normal way. We careen. And we have, we have careened from the right to the left, and now we have careened into the center. And I think that that really is very good news for Israel and for, um, for the, um, the, basic, the basic common sense of Israelis. I want to ask you about transitions. Okay, so with the first, uh, back in the last century when you started this book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was only the last century. <laughs> <laughs> it was the last century. Um, we talked, Yossi was a journalist. And he came in one day and he said two things. First of all, he said, I'm going to write up the 67 war. I'm going to write a personal journey, you know, uh, about my experience growing up in America and being influenced by the 67 war. I said, Yossi, you've written your last personal journey. Okay? <laughs> We've had it with a personal journey. You're going to have to write, your next book has to be about somebody else. <laughs> and um, looked at me with abject horror, right? <laughs> horror, somebody else? 
people. Um, and, and if I knew that you were sentencing me to an 11-year <laughs> writing project. <laughs> I, I had to go through a tremendous transition. Um, from being, you mentioned, you intimated, I went from being a writer, a historian, to being a diplomat, a person who had ideas, to a person who had positions, uh, and not even my positions, the positions of the democratically govern elected government of Israel. It was tough. You had to make a transition from being a journalist and a memoirist to a writing and being a historian and writing about other people. So the first question is, tell me about the transition. And then the harder question is going to be, have you, in writing about these seven paratroopers, just written about seven Yossi Klein Alevis and their voyage? Every, every writer, and I think this is really true for every person in, 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 in whatever field of activity we're in, everyone, the way you grow is by, is by setting yourself a challenge that's one stretch beyond what your, cap what, your, what your current capabilities are. It turned out that this book was several stretches beyond, and, and I mean that because a journalist and a historian think in two totally different ways. I was used to writing about what I was observing. To have to reconstruct Kibbutz Gan Shmuel, and I hope we're going to talk about we'll Gan Shmuel. Shmuel. Kibbutz Gan Shmuel of, uh, of 1970, where Michael spent a summer and, uh, as, as a volunteer in 1970, it was, right? And one of my main characters is from there. So and, I, uh, and his brother was my roommate. Yeah, so uh, I call Michael the Forrest Gump of the, of the story <laughs> of Israel. <laughs> and, uh, because every one of my characters is, is, is connected to Michael at least either directly or once removed. And uh, so, so, the, so the, the first stretch for me as, as a writer was, was learning that I could bring an, a, a writer's eye, a literary eye, into the, the, the work of a historian. And of course, that, and Michael is a master of being the literary historian. This is why his books are, are, are so essential. And, and you, you empowered me to do that. And, and you insisted that I do that. And how many times did you tell me uh, go back and, and show me what, what did the kibbutz smell like? Yeah, remember, remember that, that line? Yeah. Except, what did the kibbutz what did it smell, smell like? like? So I've got right. a line in the kibbutz. I said, okay, Michael, what did Gan Shmuel in 1970 <laughs> smell like? Yeah. He said it was a combination of, uh, of orange blossoms and cow dung. <laughs> that was that was Which, by the way, remains totally, you know, aphrodisiac for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So, so that Ebrosial. was... Ebrosial. Ebrosial, yeah, yeah. So that was, that was the first stretch. And in terms of, um, of uh, the general direction, Michael continuously gave me musar, really, gave me useful moral critique, saying to me that if you're writing a book about Israel, it has to be a book about love. Because we are in danger of losing our narrative, of losing our story. And one of the reasons we're losing our story is we don't know how to convey the story with its complexity, with all of the blemishes of this story, and yet still embrace it as one of the great stories, not only of Jewish history, I would argue that the return the creation of the State of Israel is the greatest story in Jewish history, but it is truly one of the great stories of humanity. And we are forgetting how to speak about this story with love. And Michael kept, kept almost berating me, right with love. And it's not easy to write about the left-right schism with love and to embrace both of those sides with love. So that was really another aspect of this, of this stretch, and really, Mori Rabi, you really taught me how to do that, Michael. Are these seven characters facets of my personality? What finally allowed me 
to embrace this book as my own was the realization that it is a personal story, Dirty, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and that it, it's, it's, it's a hidden, it's, it's, it's a sneaky personal story. It's, it's ke'ilu, it's as if I'm writing about, about others. But I, I so deeply identified with each of these seven men in different ways. All of these men were, in some sense, I felt, became part of me. Yeah, so you mentioned before that you and Michael had written uh, an article sort of predicting some of the problems we're facing with Iran back in, what, 2007 or so? Um, would either of you gentlemen care to talk a little bit about where we are now and how those things are different? And Right, yes. I wish we had the former ambassador of the State of Israel here. To, uh, to <laughs> that would be us. great. <laughs> what can I say? Yesterday, it, it seems already, you know, five years ago, but yesterday when I was in my job, we were, um, mm -hmm. Prime Minister Netanyahu went to the White House yesterday. We spoke with the President, we spoke with the Vice President, we spoke with the Secretary of State, we spoke with the National Security Advisor. And then we went over to Congress, then we went to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Um, we did it all in a day. And um, the main topic was Iran. And in between, worked on a speech that the Prime Minister gave in the General Assembly today, the other General Assembly. And um, our position, unequivocally, is that Iran has to dismantle its nuclear weapons program. Not partially, not as a gesture, but demonstrably, verifiably, meaningfully, to use President Obama's term, has to dismantle this nuclear program. Uh, if left with a partial program, it will uh, use subterfuge, and it will develop a nuclear weapon clandestinely. Um, and that is why we strongly feel that now, not only should the sanctions not, not be let up, but they have to be intensified, and they have to be linked with a credible military threat. Because the Ayatollahs think that they're paying a price. They know they're paying a very heavy price for their weapon. Uh, that's what Rouhani's about. He's not about stopping the nuclear program. He's about lifting the sanctions. Um, they know they're paying a very heavy price, but at the end of the day, they're going to get the thing. They're going to get the weapon. They have not internalized that they're paying the price for naught, and they're not going to get the weapon. And we're not there yet, because they think they don't endow that military threat with credibility, and they think that they could hoodwink the West into lifting the sanctions. And so we are at a, a crucial, um, I would say fateful junction in dealing with the Iranian nuclear program. And um, let's read, if you have a chance, read, read the Prime Minister's text of his speech today. It was an extraordinary speech. So I, I watched the speech uh, delivered today on uh, the UN website, and uh, it was a very strong speech. I'm not sure if that's the first time that he said, essentially, if we'll go it alone. Um, if we have to go it alone. Well, it was a very, it's an interesting quote, because it's a quote taken from 1967. And, um, well, we worked on the speech, and we all knew where the quote was. It's a quote, who, who said it? No, it was, um, was it Eshko? No, 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 it was Lyndon oh, it's, Johnson. Uh, that's right, he said Lyndon Johnson you, said it to Abba Ibn. If you do it, you will be on your own. It, it, right. is, Israel will, act, will only act alone if it decides right. to act alone. Right. Right. And it was, an, it was, literal, it was, it was an historic literary reference put in there by the Prime Minister, on purpose. And uh, he was putting the world on notice that Israel will not, no not, uh, countenance a, a nuclear weapon in the hands of the Iranian regime, and that if Israel has to act alone, we act alone. And in doing so, uh, the Prime Minister is, is drawing from a tradition of Israeli Prime Ministers from different parties. Levi Eshkol, uh, Ben-Gurion, Ben-Gurion twice, in 56 and in 48. Eshkol, Ben-Gurion, were told by the world, give more time for diplomacy. You know, Israel, Israel's in danger, but we can work this out. And what the Prime Minister is saying is that we came back to our sovereignty in our ancient homeland after 2,000 years of exile, three years after the Holocaust. We didn't come back to die. We came back so that we would have the sovereign right to defend ourselves. And it's not just the sovereign right, it's the sovereign duty to defend ourselves. We would prefer not to have to go there. No country has a greater interest in a diplomatic solution than Israel has. We have the most to lose. We have the most skin in the game. But we will not be led into a situation where an Iranian nuclear bomb will be dangling literally over our heads. 
and, uh, and when the entire Middle East will be transformed into a, a nuclear neighborhood. We won't be worrying about chemical weapons, we'll worry about nuclear weapons. Yos? Michael, I have a question for you, which is that um, if people had paid attention <clears throat> to the talks you gave over the last four and a half years, they would have noticed a, um, a constant theme about Jewish history, identity, faith, faith in, in Jewish survival in what we call Netzach Yisrael, the eternity of Israel, which is a kind of an approximation or an echo of the eternity of the divine. And coming through the talks you gave, which were really far more profound than what we come to expect even from most Israeli diplomats. There, I want to really ask you about the source of your faith, the source of your faith in Jewish history, in Jewish peoplehood, and what kept you going through some very, very difficult times, which um, even I, as your closest friend, I mean, I would call Michael and say, what's going on? And he'd say, oh, it's just unbelievable. You can't imagine what's going on, but I can t tell you about it. <laughs> and uh, that, and that was literally, literally yeah. our conversation for four and a half years. Yeah, it's, it's and, you and uh, me and the other five people listening to my telephone. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, guys. They want to know, too. That's right. They were very That's frustrated. Right. That's right. You know? um, and, um, and so what, what got you through, Michael, all of those, those crises, crises that that we may never know about, unless you choose to tell us tonight no, what right. actually happened. So it's like how hot time. dogs are made. You, you <laughs> don't want to know. Um, but, but really, the source, the source of your faith. Um, well, first of all, I, I come from a, a family that was very much involved in, in the Jewish community. Um, my parents are here with me this evening, as, as, as Gary said, Rabbi Elliot said, my parents are here. And, um, and they instilled in me uh, a sense of a strong sense of Jewish peoplehood, a strong sense of history. My father, World War II veteran, um, and a sense of growing up in the shadow of the Holocaust, in, in in redemptive events like the Six Day War, where we really went through that period. I remember my parents sitting in front of the television set from the period leading up to the Six Day War and, and wringing their hands, saying, "We're going to live through a second Holocaust in one generation." We were convinced. So there was a sense that we were living through historic times. Um, and it gave me, it endowed uh, me, it endowed me in a, in a deep sense of being a part of Jewish history. And if you saw yourself as part of Jewish history, then the difficulties are put in context. Um, another commonality we had in writing the book was that I served in the paratroopers, and I served with a lot of these people. Uh, it, well into, into the 80s, these guys were doing reserve, reserve duty. I was in awe of them. And I'd be in a, you know, in a Jeep with them or an armored personnel carrier, and this guy was, was had, had liberated the Kotel, all right? And we're, we're standing guard together somewhere. Um, uh, it wasn't easy. The Israeli army wasn't easy. Being a, what they call the Chayal Boded, right? A, a, a lone soldier not having parents wasn't easy. None of it was easy. Um, Sally, my wife, is here. We, we, we struggled through years in Israel. You struggled through years in Israel. Life in Israel was not always easy. Um, what kept us going always, Yosef, and I think I can speak for you, was the sense of belief in Netzach Yisrael. Now, without getting into detail of what Netzach Yisrael is, because one of the big differences that Yossi I and I have was that I think you are more at peace. Why would I say this now? You, you think you had, have had a better response to the Holocaust than I think I've had. I'm still waiting for an answer, personally. I think we're, we, we are owed an answer. Um, and that's become an, an issue in my faith, but it's not a, an issue in my belief. Well, it's not a crippling issue in your belief. No, no, this, no. This is really, I think, the, the crucial point here. So how, how, do, you, how do you draw your, 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 your faith in the, not just the worthiness of this story, but in the, 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 the durability of the story? Because, I mean, you, 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 you've seen close up what we're up against, what we're really up against. And you've spoken for the last four and a half years about an existential threat that faces the state of Israel, not just Iran, but I, how many times have people here heard Michael speak about, about the 100,000 missiles that are aimed at Israeli cities? And, and yet you, you, you convey at the same time a sense, a deep, quiet sense, that, you know, gamze ya'avo, this is going to pass as well. We will get through this. 
Why? Why I was, do you believe that? It's funny. I was asked by a, a very high-ranking member of the, of the Obama administration once, how would I, as an, uh, a military historian, how would I characterize Israel's uh, strategic position today? And I said to him, I said, at, at best we are in May 1967, and at worst we are in May 1948. Remember when I told you this story? Sure. Sure. He says, what does that mean? And I said, well, I said, never before has the state of Israel faced such a broad spectrum of monumental and seemingly insurmountable threats at the same time. 100,000 rockets are just in the hands of Hezbollah, folks. Not including what's in the hands of Gaza. Not including now in Sinai. And no country in history has ever faced a threat like that. Just it, it, between 2009 and 2012, more rockets hit southern Israel from Gaza twice as many rockets hit southern Israel from Gaza than fell in all of London during all of World War II. No country in history has ever faced anything like this. And that's just the rockets. That's not the, the possible collapse of Jordan, which is our, our security border uh, to the east. Our, the border is not the Jordanian-Israeli border, it's the Jordanian-Iraqi border. Jordan, among other things, is what keeps Iraq and Iran out of our backyard. Uh, it's Syria. It's uh, the Iranian nuclear program. It's sequestration in this country, uh, war weariness in this country, reluctance to project power abroad, all of this combines to make a threat, which is, as I said, at best May 1967, at worst 1948. So then the question again, how then do you get up in the morning, how do you raise my children here? Um, how do you raise your children in a state like that? Who in their right mind would raise their kids in a state like that? And then I turned around and said to the same high-ranking member of the administration, Israel, at the same time today, is in an inestimably better geostrategic, political, economic situation than it's ever been in the last 65 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about it. We grew up in a period where there was a thing called the Soviet bloc that wanted us destroyed. Today, some of our best relations in Europe were with former Soviet bloc countries. We had no relations with China. Our son lives in China. We had no relations with India. Right? India wouldn't let our chess team play. We had no strategic alliance with the United States. This war, 1967, was fought with French arms. The Americans wouldn't give us a single bullet. People forget that. That we're a member of the OECD, that we're one of the most developed economies in the world today. In 67, what was the line? The last person out of Blood Airport closed the light. The economy had, had collapsed. Um, Eight million people, more people speak Hebrew today than speak Swedish or Danish. We're closing in on Finnish. You know? We're, 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 we're <laughs> Um, I mean, I can go on and on. Israel, Israel is, an ex, is an extraordinary a success story. It's a powerhouse of a success story. At the same time, we're facing all these. What's the difference? How do we keep on doing it? I think it has to do with faith. I think it has to do that we've overcome what we overcame in 1967, in October 1973, in 2000 to 2005, which were as you and I know, was an existential period. The for us hard, as well. I think it was the hardest period in Israel. I think it's the hardest period in Israel. We both yeah. agree. The first, the second, the second intifada, intifada. intifada was the, we came this close to losing the state. This yeah. close to losing our public space. We just they yeah. could have killed us, mm -hmm. and we won it. It was the one thing that Edward Barak got right as prime minister. He said, "It's not a fight. It's not a military fight. It's a fight between two societies, mm -hmm. which is stronger, and our society proved to be stronger." Um, and it's a that's about. That is about faith. I, if, um, if I can take this in a, in a slightly different direction and ask you a question and really, in some sense, let people here eavesdrop on our conversation over the last four and a half years. Much of, of your work, Michael, was directed toward the American Jewish community, toward trying to get the American Jewish community to understand that while issues of religious pluralism are important and women are the wall and all of these issues need to be faced, we are in an existential moment and we need to get the balance of priorities right. And what I sensed from you over the years was, was a certain frustration that you weren't getting through the message that for whatever reason, American Jews did not grasp that we were in, let's say, a protracted version of 1967. I mean, May 1967 was easy for us to get because it was immediate. The threat was, was measured in, in weeks and days. 
this is a threat that's been measured over months and years. And, and you have tried really more than, than, than most Israeli public figures that I can think of to, to sound the alarm, with, to get American Jews to face the reality of this moment. And it seems to me it's one of the few failures of your, uh, of Indeed. your service. Before you, know, you, before you respond, let me just uh, piggyback on that, on that question, because today the uh, Pew Center released this major study, the first uh, major study of American Jewish identity in, uh, since 2001, uh, and much of it is, is pretty bleak in terms of uh, the, the percentage of American Jews who say they have no religion has tripled from 7% to 22%. Uh, more Jews are marrying out of the faith, less J Jews are raising their children as Jews, um, and in terms of Israel, the, uh, let's see, 38% say Israel's government is making a sincere effort to make peace with the Palestinians. 30, 38%. 38%. I don't know how that compares to Israel, by the way, also, seriously. And 17% say the continued building of settlements in the West Bank is helpful to Israel's security. So just to add that to the package. Where to begin? Where to begin on all this? Yes, it's been frustrating. Um, you and I, Yossi, we both grew up. There were, well, the, the other transformative event in our lives, in addition to the 67 war, was the Soviet Jewry movement. And um, we, bo we both went there. And we both went there. We were both arrested there and, uh, and went through a lot. And, and I, my model was, was the Soviet Jewry movement, particularly, you know, Triple SJ. Mm -hmm. and, um, I was visiting a, a JCC in northern New Jersey, and a couple of uh, Jewish day school students, young women, came up to me, and they had started this campaign called, called uh, Stop the Uranian Nukes. And they had these magnets that fit on cars and buttons. And I said, there you are. I've been looking for you. Let's get this, let's get this moving. And I brought them to Washington. I brought them to Capitol Hill, tried to promote them through Federation, tried to get this moving, and it got almost nowhere. Not almost nowhere. Forget the 100,000 rockets. Here we have a regime that is planning a nuclear bomb and saying openly that their goal is genocide. Now, how horrific is that? What kind of historical reverber reverberations that has for us as the Jewish people? And not to be able to get, to be able to sit, you know, we're going to talk more about efforts to hold the Jewish people together. But one of the successes, I wouldn't say it's an alarming success, was to get rabbis from different uh, movements. Uh, in America, from Reconstructionists to actually Haredim, to sit around the same tables. We instituted a series of tishes around the country. Interestingly enough, the tishes could only be held under the auspices of Israeli consulates. It's the only place these rabbis, ra it was neutral territory, the only place the rabbis could sit around. And what came out in so many of these discussions was that rabbis increasingly were unwilling to talk about the Iranian nuclear threat because it was controversial. Now, I would never interfere in these two. I, I was there to look just to, to, you know, to, to facilitate, not to participate. But when rabbis would say that, I would almost lose it. I said, let me get this straight. You have this regime that is killing Jews around the world, by the way. It's not, it's not abstract. Buenos Aires, Borgas, they're killing Jews around the world. They've provided these rockets to, to, to Hezbollah, to Hamas. They say open, they're denying the Holocaust. They're trying to perpetrate to, to, to prepare another Holocaust, six million Jews in the state of Israel. And, according to, and, you, and that's controversial? You're not gonna talk about that in your sermons? Shame on you, shame on you. Hard to hear that. And yet, and yet, I would ask how many people here lose sleep every night wondering about, you know, worrying about the fate of the state of Israel in the shadow of the Iranian nuclear threat. Very difficult. It is true, we have to address issues like the Kotel, women of the wall, conversion issues. I spent an immense number of hours on all of these things. But also to see, to see them in context and in proportion. You and, you and I grew up in a very different Jewish community and a very different relationship with Israel. It, was, um, it wasn't only easy to fall in love with Israel in those years. It was, it was in some sense, inevitable. And it was cool. It was cool. Israel was cool. Israel, Israel, <laughs> still uh, cool. yeah. And, yeah. and I, found, uh, I recently found a, a series of photographs 
that, uh, that were taken of me in the summer of 67. I was 14 years old, my first trip to Israel. And I start out the summer as a pudgy, pale Jewish boy from Brooklyn. And I don't know how to stand. I don't know what to do with my hands and all these pictures. I'm standing in front of a, a Syrian tank. And this is, this is summer 67. And at the end of the summer, I, I have miraculously lost weight, grown. I'm wearing sandals. I'm tan. And I'm wearing a bullet around my neck, which is what, <laughs> which is what young Israelis wore in the summer of 67. And that's really, that was, when you say it was cool, that was our generation's experience of Israel. So my question to you, Michael, is you have been on the American Jewish circuit intensively for the last four and a half years, probably more than, I would, I would guess, more than, than any other Israeli ambassador. And, um, and so what observations do you have about, this, about the new generation of American Jews? How do we get them to fall in love? with Israel, because when we speak about Iran, when we speak about the missiles, it's not getting through. We need to speak to young American Jews in a different way. Now we do, though, you know, we talk about, you know, we talk about the high tech, we talk about the great food, we talk about, you know, the beach life, we talk about the club life. I mean, Israel, my kids will tell you, Israel's fun. Israel's incredibly fun. The, the um, joke is that Israel now is cool. It, it actually was not cool. It was we not cool. When I, you met, I told you when I got to the kibbutz, it's in the book, by the way. When I got to the kibbutz in, in 1970, the first thing they did was take me off to get my hair cut off because I had two Yeah, that hair. line actually came from it, Michael. It's in the book. I saw that one. Uh, still, they were, they were afraid of the 60s. And, you know, this is the country that kept the Beatles out, right? They wouldn't let the Beatles perform in Israel. They were, you know. And what we wouldn't do today to bring in an imitation group of the of Beatles. Beatles. <laughs> oh, God, I guess. Um, you know, at the height of the Intifada, Sally and I sat down with our kids, and we were in Jerusalem, the bus and the bombs are going off every day, and we, we sat around, we, we looked at our kids and said, listen, we, we were realizing our Zionist dream. This was our Zionist fantasy, moving to Israel, but you guys didn't get a choice, you were born here. And now people, the bombs are going off, did we make a mistake? Did we do something terrible? Were we unfair to them? And what did you say, Leah? <laughs> you said something to the effect of, you know, raising us in Israel was the greatest single thing you could have done for us as parents. It was unscripted. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Letting us off the hook in that way. Um, listen, we have tools today. I mean, you and I, we used to work all year long snuff, shoveling snow, mowing grass, to save up enough pennies to go to Israel in order to work on the kibbutz for free. <laughs> We didn't know all we had to do was wait for birthright. Right, right, right. We later. were not. We were crazy. <laughs> Sally did this too. Work, we work, we, we were just, we felt, our, we felt we were so ineffably blessed to be able to have this opportunity to go and work for free on the kibbutz, getting up at four o'clock in the morning and picking whatever you were picking. And I was a Jewish cowboy on the Golan Heights. How cool was that? I used to call, I used to call myself Oyu Rogers. <laughs> but, must have um, been all that cow dung. That, but the, it, but that's the today, key, though, today there's, there's, there's birthright. You have all these programs. We can go to Israel for free. And it, has, it does have an impact. And I'm, I'm, a little bit, I, I'm a little skeptical about some of these figures. Um, you know, with all due respect to the Pew organization, I am in contact with the Jewish community. And I think that Israel means uh, much more than that's reflected by those. And don't believe everything you read. And uh, if we've learned any, anything from the last episode of Syria, where you know polls showed a certain number of Americans were supportive action in Syria, and a certain amount of Americans were opposed, turns out those polls were wildly off. That uh, a far, far greater percentage of American population was against action in Syria than that was reflected by the polls. So I'm always a little bit skeptical by some of those. What do you think? What do we do? Well, you know, it's interesting because for the last years I've been uh, sitting at uh, the Hartman Institute in Jerusalem and working on, on exactly this question, which is how do we engage young American Jews? That's the project that, that you know, I've been involved in. And, and what we've tried to do is change what we call the crisis narrative to a values narrative, to talk about, to try to bring American Jews into the conversation of the quality of, of Israeli society, that Israel is not just the project of, of the citizens of Israel. Israel is your project, too. It's a project of the Jewish people. And if we're serious about Jewish peoplehood, then we in Israel have a responsibility, not just to tolerate diaspora critique of Israeli life, but to welcome it, to embrace it. 
Of course, I think there, 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 needs, there needs to be ground rules, and this is something that Michael, you and I have talked about in, in People in who is the detail. ground rule. We're part of the same people. Yes, and, and that's, that's and the such an, under such and threat the today. And the criticism has to come from love and a deep concern, not only for Israel's soul, but also for Israel's physical well-being. And sometimes that tends to, to be underplayed, shall we say, in some of the Jewish criticism of Israel. So, but the, the, the basis really of this, of this approach that I've been involved in is moving from what we call the crisis narrative to the values narrative. Now, I, I have to tell you, Michael, and you know, we, we have talked about this, I've had ambivalence about saying moving from the crisis narrative to a values narrative because our, our enemies haven't heard that the crisis narrative is over. And, and so we are, the challenge for us is to be dealing effectively with the crisis narrative while at the same time nurturing a deeper uh, and more sophisticated diaspora Jewish conversation. I think we have a tremendous opportunity in this generation. We have a sovereign Jewish state where we're responsible, we're on our own. We, we, we call the shots. And we are responsible for creating the quality of Israeli society, the nature of our culture, the next stage of Jewish civilization. And what you have here is, is, is also a miracle of Jewish history. You are not just a, a, a secure minority in the most powerful and important country in history, but the public space of this country invites you as Jews to participate in, in the great debates of, of, of American Being society. Being Jewish is cool in America. Being Jewish is cool in America. Yeah. And so we, we have the opportunity today to take advantage of an unprecedented moment of success in Jewish history. Amazing. And, and I think that, that and if, if, if we talk about how to re-engage young Jews in, in the Israeli relationship, I think we need to start exciting ourselves again and say, yes, and what you said before is exactly right. On the one hand, unprecedented existential threats. On the other hand, unprecedented achievements and, and, and extraordinary reasons to celebrate. And that's the balance that you, I think but, but, you, but the to, common, uh, to But the common thread here is history, is seeing this moment in historical context. We are living in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a totally unique moment in Jewish history where all the Jews of the world are free. Think about this for a second. When we grew up, a large share of the Jewish people weren't free. That's right. It's amazing the that moment, we have these two communities, the, the North right. American Jewish community and the Israel community, that, that is, they're just hugely successful. The moment that the exile, that the 2,000-year-old exile ended was 1989 when the Iron Curtain fell, and there, are no, there is no longer an exile. There is diaspora, which is voluntary. There's no exile anymore. I called Yossi, I was upset, because I was, you know, Elliot, forgive me, I was looking at the, the, the conservative machzor this year, and there were two prayers that struck me. One was a prayer for oppressed Jewish communities. I thought, there's an extraneous prayer. <laughs> <laughs> All right? And the other prayer was the prayer for the, for the, for the state of Israel which for the first time in my memory contained a parenthetical uh, option, which was Israel, state of Israel, God bless the state of Israel, which is the beginning of the flourishing of redemption. redemption which, is, which is the traditional prayer. It's Cookian, right? Mm -hmm. It's a double qualifier. It's not redemption. It's not the flourishing of redemption. It's the beginning of the flourishing of redemption. Mm -hmm. nice. And the conservative right. movement found it Found, right, found it appropriate to put in a third qualifier, in parentheses, may it be. <laughs> and we both had the same reaction. This is ingratitude, folks. Ingratitude. That's ingratitude. the key word. Three years, three years to the date after the liberation of Auschwitz, almost, the end of the VE day in Europe, a Jewish state is created. It fights off six Arab armies with handguns. It fights off war after war, continual attempts to destroy it. It absorbs millions of refugees. It revives the Hebrew language. It becomes a powerhouse of technology and science and learning. It, what else, would you go on and on? That's, from, from my point of view, that is redemption enough. 
That's reason Somebody's enough to say Somebody's telling us prayer. something, folks. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody's whispering in our ears, like that, that joke, you know, idiot, we sent you a card, <laughs> right? That line, someone's telling us something. And are, are, are the Jewish people listening? It's the question we have to ask is, are the Jewish people listening? Yes, we've got problems. Yes, sovereignty is messy. We've got a question of settlements. We've got a question, we, we've got an occupation that we don't like, but we can't give it up because it's going to endanger us, perhaps existentially as well. If, if the West Bank became like Gaza or, the, or, or southern Lebanon. Um, yes, we've got different people who want to observe their Judaism in different ways. But, yalla, I mean, really. You know, we are funny. living in the age of miracles. And people aren't sufficiently aware that we're living in a miraculous age. And we're... <laughs> it's really the... the um, it's funny that, yeah, it's, it's funny. It's, it's, funny that you, it's funny that you're, It comes yes. back to the title of your book. Yeah, yeah. And, it's, and, what, what, and what, what happens in, in Shira Malot when the Jews, when the Jews realize you're living in a messianic age, what do they do? They laugh. Mm -hmm. They laugh. They laugh from sheer joy. Mm -hmm. And the nations of the world look at us and say, look at the Jews, they're laughing. That's interesting. You were talking about, about ingratitude as, the, as really the, the sin. And that and ingratitude goes back to, to the Exodus. It goes back to Egypt, this, this ingratitude for miracles. And Gary, I, I, um, I spoke uh, last year, I think it was, at the conversation. The Jewish Week sponsors a, uh, a, a terrific uh, kind of off-the-record ongoing conversation of Jews from different, uh, different parts of the community. And someone there asked me, uh, what, um, what do we need? What do we need in order to reconnect uh, to American Jews, to the state of Israel? And my answer was very simple, gratitude. Start from the place of gratitude. Well, and I, love. I, and love. And love. I you think know? it's, um, we could go on for we all could. night, <laughs> for another 25 years. We will after yeah, this. We will, believe me. <laughs> Um, and I just want to say it's been, I think, a privilege for me and for all of us to, um, to listen in and, um, and um, really hear an authentic conversation like this that uh, we don't often do. I think it's appropriate, Yossi, that um, the last line in your book is, uh, you know, one of the characters heading toward the Western Wall, and you write, grateful to be a Jew in this time. So we come back to the connection of gratitude and ingratitude, and I think it's a message uh, for all of us to, to take with us. And I just want to thank you both for sharing this evening with us. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.